Welcome to the Pier Glass Poetry Panels. I'm Stan Galloway, your host, and today's panel engages ekphrastic poetry. We'll be hearing from poets in the US and Australia. If you're joining us live, we ask you not to use the chat function, but instead send your questions and comments through the Q&A box at our website, peerglasspoetry.wixsite.com slash my site. We'll take a look at those toward the end of the show. But now to get us started, let's meet our first poet. Hedy Habra, poet, artist, and essayist, has authored three poetry collections, The Taste of the Earth, winner of the Silver Nautilus Book Award, Tea in Heliopolis, winner of the Best Book Award, and an ekphrastic collection, Under Brush Strokes, that was the finalist for the Best Book Award and the International Book Award. Her story collection, Flying Carpets, won the Arab American Book Awards honorable mention and was finalist for the Eric Hoffer Award, a 16-time nominee for the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net and recipient of the Nazim Hikmet Award. Her multilingual work appears in numerous journals and anthologies. We're happy to have you here, Hetty. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, Stan. While the word ekphrastic might be new to some people, the concept is not. Tell us about your experience at the intersection of art and poetry. I will be delighted to do so. Let me see if I can get to my presentation. Um, and uh, it's going to be a pleasure to talk about my passion. I think I lost my, uh, just a second, might have lost the PowerPoint. Yes, it's back. So um, I'd like to talk about my experience with uh, writing ekphrastic poetry, but mainly my passion for poetry and visual art. And I see uh, the uh, influence between uh, my own visual art and uh, my poetry as an inter-artistic uh, dialogue. My passion for art started when I was very young. Uh, my mother's paintings covered the walls of our house in Heliopolis, Egypt. This is one of her paintings. And as a very little uh, young child, I used to engage in a dialogue with the characters of these paintings and imagine what the characters would think or uh, tell one another in a given painting. So this influenced me a lot. And decades later, I wrote several ekphrastic poems inspired by my mother's painting. And uh, uh, they are part of the collection, my first collection titled Teen Heliopolis, in which I have other ekphrastic poems uh, inspired by other by, by famous artists, but um, it is mainly a memoir in poems. I chose to paint the cover of uh, Teen Heliopolis um, to uh, echo my poems. It represents uh, the terrace of the Heliopolis Palace Hotel, which uh, symbolizes a bygone era. And it is not only uh, uh, a painting in response, to my poems, but as I painted it and afterwards, many poems were inspired by this painting. This is a painting, a Chinese ink brush painting on rice paper that I did, uh, Blue Heron's uh, Embrace, as a response to one of the poems in Chi in Heliopolis, which is titled Blue Heron. For my ekphrastic collection, under brush strokes, I chose uh, to paint uh, a woman in midst, bathing in midst of lotuses. Uh, for the Chinese, um, poetry and painting are inseparable, and many paintings are covered with verses in Chinese uh, uh, script. And uh, I, I feel that uh, those empty spaces in Chinese art correspond to the silences and pauses in poetry. And the lotus, which represents renewal, for me um, uh, symbolizes the fact that uh, every ekphrastic poem gives a new life to a painting. 
So this is the cover of Under Brushstroke. And uh, the poems in Under Brushstrokes are inspired by paintings uh, from different periods and styles, Hokusai, Bosch, Goya, uh, famous painters, and others, a lesser known artist that I discovered uh, as I uh, was writing uh, the book. And um, I will be showing a few of the paintings just to give you an idea of how I was inspired uh, to write the poems uh, uh, depending upon uh, the paintings. So uh, this is uh, Initiation, uh, uh, the poem. Uh, initiation was inspired by a painting by Dali, Archaeological Reminiscence of Millet's Angelus. And uh, I imagine uh, that a father was guiding his son. You see the two characters. And so the poem is in the voice of the father inviting his son to visit the colossal ruins. I wrote a poem inspired by Goya's dark paintings, which he painted at the end of his life. And uh, this poem uh, is, uh, in this poem, the speaker addresses the, the artist. So um, for this poem, uh, I needed to have a very good knowledge of the artist's life and work. This is a stained glass by Chagall, and uh, the poem uh, delves into the dreams and the thoughts of the bride and groom after they go to bed and they um, converse with the crescent moon. This painting uh, inspired me uh, to write about the myth of Apollo and Daphne. Uh, Daphne, uh, in order to escape uh, her pursuer, Apollo, uh, was transformed into a tree. And um, my take on that painting is I give voice to uh, the female character, Daphne, and um, she's telling her story, which inverts the official story, um, and uh, laments, regrets her decision to have escaped uh, the knowledge of love. And so there are many poems in Under Brushstrokes that are inspired by paintings about myths in which I give voice to uh, the female character. The Embrace by the expressionistic Austrian Egon Schiele. Uh, in this poem, uh, the speaker's voice is supposedly the artist. So it's an appropriation of the voice of the artist and the artist in the poem is uh, um, talking uh, to the uh, models that he's painting and at the same time uh, uh, talking about his process of painting them. His telling uh, the uh, couple to take such and such gesture or position. Uh, Degas is very well known for his uh, um, ballerinas. And I wrote a poem inspired by this painting in which uh, um, the voice follows the ballerinas backstage and all the way to their home in a series of small haikus that seemed to me to sort of pattern uh, their pirouettes and dances. I've written many uh, poems in under brush strokes um, about abstract paintings. This is one example. And uh, all the um, contemporary artists that I've discovered, when I came about, when I started writing poems about these paintings, I had no idea uh, of uh, uh, who was the artist. I didn't know the title. I found it absolutely liberating, but at the same time, a great challenge. And so uh, for this painting, I wrote a poem titled Origin in the first person, a persona poem. And uh, it is a grain of sand that remember, who remembers or that remembers uh, its birthplace its trajectory until it is sacrificed in a pyre and uh, emerges as a, a blown glass crimson flower. 
I will be reading three poems from Under Brush Strokes and one poem from a recent uh, collection that I have uh, almost finished um, that is all about uh, women's uh, artists. So um, the memory of unspoken words was inspired by Siren by Frederick Clement. She has landed on the deck of an abandoned wreck, fails to remember how she swallowed the fiery ball that pulled her like a tidal wave into the stillness of a metallic sky steeped in lavender, where angry clouds hover around the drowning sun suffused with coral. Her pillow is a melted cloud filled with birds that forgot how to fly and now swim in a pool that overflows the deck, washing the souls of dead sailors from every leak and corner. She presses on her eyelids to find a different ending to their story, sees her body glow with scales and the fish in the pool grow wings. She knows every drop of water will vanish at dawn, erasing with black ink her luminous shape, alive only in the formless night, and the rainbow will soon shine over a boat with discarded bags, heavy with the stained memory of unspoken words and broken planks. This next painting, as well as the previous one, when I wrote the poems, I had absolutely no idea about the context or the artist. And uh, as it often happens when we write uh, persona poems, either in the first person or the third person from the perspective of a character, uh, this particular poem I wrote in the first person um, uh, from the perspective, the giving voice to the character, but as I was uh, writing it, in some ways my personal reminiscence uh, ended up uh, allowing me to penetrate both the painting and the poem for a short while. So this uh, poem is titled The Upright Piano. I see myself out in the cold, draped in a silk nightgown, seated barefoot on a stool by that upright piano. You know, the one my mother bought when she thought I should take piano lessons while others played during recess. Oh, how I first struggled striking notes daily practicing scales, then rehearsing Mozart's Rondo a la Turca till I'd play it in my mind relentlessly, tan, 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 even when I knew I'd never learned another piece. And now, half a century later, I am drawing with memory's wavering lines that same piano to make it the vessel of my heart's message of so much left unsaid buried in a bitter well, turning into notes that rise in tongues of cold fire, licking my insides with every key I touch. Unharmed, I feel the piano ablaze under my fingertips. Twisted candles adorn its top that grows into a tower and turrets spouting flames from windows, a menace to the adjacent branches. My fingers widely strike the keyboard while the sky opens up like a stage filled with shimmering damask memories dancing to the melody like maddened fireflies. The next the poem I'll read is titled Desert Song at, and it is uh, 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 in the third person, a third, third person persona prose poem from the perspective or the point of view of that character here. Uh, I have worked extensively with Latin American literature and was greatly influenced by a magical realism. So I have this predilection for art, uh, which blurs the borderlines between fantasy and reality. Here's the poem. Desert Song. It all started when he set out in his suit and tie, searching for a sand rose in the desert. Wandering through dreams' thresholds, he hoped to unearth a treasure 
that would resist the drought of feelings. Each millenary facet telling of the innumerable ways love can be immortalized. He must have taken a wrong turn since all he found erect like a man here was a fossil. Was it the hip of a dinosaur or rather a titan's lost from times beyond memory? So smoothed by the scorching sun that it bore no signs? Looking closely, he saw an open jaw with pointed teeth and a hole where an eye once stared. He feared he had no to return empty-handed in time for his date, but realized with terror that he had no recollection of the path that led him there. Now, uh, as I'm ending my presentation, I'd like to show three paintings uh, that inspired poems, um, the poems that are in my new upcoming book. Uh, this uh, painting uh, is by Juanita Guccione, and I wrote a poem in which uh, the female uh, character ponders or meditates upon the different roles she has played and keeps playing on a daily basis. This is an installation titled Keys by a Japanese artist, Shiharu Shiota, and the originality of this uh, painting or installation, visual art, uh, inspired me to write in a totally different form uh, with anaphorical repetitions beginning with the word keys. And the poem is titled, Or How Do You Keep Track of All the Keys You Once Owned? And this, uh, I will be reading uh, the poem inspired by this painting. This is the last painting I'm showing and the last poem I'll read. Uh, Remedios Varo is a Spanish-Mexican artist that I've always greatly admired. And I wrote many poems inspired by her work, both in Underbrush Stroke and maybe uh, a dozen and a half in, for the new manuscript. So this uh, painting, She's a surrealistic painter, and it's titled Woman Leaving the Psychoanalyst. And I wrote a sort of monologue uh, titled, Or Would I Finally Be Allowed to Leave My Analyst? Or could I finally be allowed to leave my analyst? I'm leaving his office with my hair standing on end. No iPhone at hand, or else that would have made a great selfie. I walk out with a steady stride, tired of these useless sessions. After all, am I not reconciled with my dark side? No more makeup to hide the once widening circles around my eyes. I'll let the gray show on my temples. Allow my electric hair to rise and curl at will catching sunlight and moonbeams in its spires. I don't need him anymore, but he doesn't seem to know it. There's still work to be done, he says, wants me back over and over again. I have no more stories to tell, no more foggy areas to recover, forge, and weld. Has he become addicted to my voice? Or does he see his own shadow reflected in my dreams? See, this is the story of my life, analyzing instead of being analyzed, entertaining instead of being entertained. Stop presenting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hetty. Uh, the the beauty of your painting as well as your words uh, astound me. Uh, you know, so often we we think of people uh, in terms of a a single excelling force that they have, and to see your artwork as well as your poetry and recognize that you are at a minimum, double-pronged, 
if not, you know, triple or quadruple pronged in your excellence. Uh, we're so happy uh, that you had time to share that with us. Thank you so much for your kind words. Mm. Let's move now uh, to our second presenter. Uh, Anita Jawari is a Melbourne artist and writer. As an artist, Nita has held 13 solo shows and has appeared in several group and community exhibitions. She is a guide at the National Gallery of Victoria. As a writer, Anita produced and delivered the Dickensian Challenge, where she undertook to write a story a week for community radio and has written over 300 journalistic and academic articles. She is also author of The Perpetual Table, during lockdown in 2020, Anita began writing ekphrastic poetry and has not stopped. We're so happy you could join us today. Thank you so much, Dan. It, it's so great to be here. And Hedy, I really enjoyed your presentation. Your poem about the burning piano reminded me instantly about how I feel when I try to write a poem about my own work and it's like touching fire. So I actually found this whole process of examining my work in order to, to um, explain it to others very, very valuable and I'll tell you more about that later. But um, so for now I'm just going to move my screen around a little bit and fiddle with it. Uh, and to tell you a little about how I started writing poetry, because short story is my preferred form. In the six months of writing ekphrastic poetry during lockdown, and I took to it because I am an artist, I came to understand that a work of art is never fully formed. It's a process, and where one artist leaves off, another begins, and that any creative work is intimately connected with the urge to life, with the growth of seed and sapling, and passing and regeneration. Ekphrasis is a noble art. It ensures that a work of art never dies. First of all, I wish to acknowledge that I am actually now talking to you from the land of the Bunwarong people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, the two poems that I'm going to read to you today are inspired by two works, 19th century works, in the National Gallery of Victoria, to whom I owe an education in art because I am a self-taught artist. The first painting... Um, by Edward Manet in Paris, 1880, and the other was painted by Florence Fuller in Melbourne eight years later, both very different poems and each eliciting um, different styles, both different paintings, different styles of work. So let me take you straight into this screen where you can see, hopefully, uh, the image for the first poem by Edward Manet called The Melon. I click and I click again. And, yes, there is a dialogue leading the way. And here I click yet again and allow. Now you are allowed to see my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not now, here. now it's coming. Now it, it's it just coming. takes a while yes, to get around the world. It, it does. It yep. does. Now we have it. Okay. You have it. Excellent. All right. So Edward Manet's Melon. Now, each time I walked past this work in the gallery, I thought, why did Manet bother painting it? This melon is so ugly. There is no warmth in its colouring, no smoothness in its skin. And it's not as if the artist was learning from the exercise. He was a mature artist when he painted it. But he knew what I did not know. And that is that 
everything has a right to be here, everyone has a right to be here, that, oh, sorry, I've lost my place. There we go. And that it's beauty, it's beauty, which is so important to an artist, lies in its ugliness. So I'm going to read you this poem uh, and then talk about what I discovered about it after having to study it again for you. The melon. You fill the whole canvas, unashamed of your pockled skin, your puke green novels, your head severed at the stem, unaware of your dumb, ugly stare, never questioning your right to be there. You sit, severed head, full forward on a white tabletop and cast a large grey shadow over everything that once might have been held to be beautiful. So what did I notice after I wrote the poem? Well, the word pockled actually doesn't exist, but it seemed right to me through the sound and texture and matching the rough, bumpy texture of the melon itself. The word severed I used twice, once as a verb, once as an adjective. And that leads to the main theme of the poem the, the, and the conclusion that I drew from this painting. I shall show you if you can see the next slide. And that is that whereas the melon was severed from its roots, this really is about the severance from preconceptions of what is beautiful. And that's the beauty of art and the beauty of writing about art. Now the next poem. Here we come. I hope you can see that screen. Florence Fuller practised in Melbourne. She was a South African-born artist and she painted this work. It was part of a series of disadvantaged boys. She was only 20 years old when she painted this work. Paper boys or herald boys were young boys who sold newspapers on Melbourne streets. Even when I was growing up, I remember hearing their cry, Herald, at 6 a.m. through to 11 p.m. each day. In Fuller's time, these boys were often homeless or supporting their single mothers and siblings. They were poorly educated and exposed to many dangers on the streets. There are many issues behind the simplicity of this portrait. When Florence Fuller painted this work, Melbourne was a wealthy city. We were known as marvellous Melbourne. We had gold under our feet. At the time, the east end of Collins Street, where it set, the Paris end as we call it today, was a prestigious district of doctors' residences and chambers, the Treasury, the Athenaeum Theatre, the prestigious Melbourne Club, the Herald Night School established by the paper for Herald Boys and the artist studios of Grosvenor Chambers where Florence Fuller worked. I'd like to show you a picture of this. And again, I hope that it comes through. Things take a little while. So I hope you can see the name behind the tree, Grosvenor Chambers. That's where she worked. And look at the windows. You would wonder, are they pier glass windows? I thought that was a very interesting connection with this panel. Now, the poem. Okay. In terms of place, actually, the, the poem is leaping uh, in many different directions. From heaven to a back alley usually used for night soil collection. Football is an iconic Melbourne game. Theatre going was popular and the boys had to wait till the shows were out for the last sales of their paper. 
So the poem that I'm going to read you is structured like a series of pier glass panels, some mirrors, some windows, looking in, looking out in different directions and from different perspectives. Now, here we go. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, this one. I shall read you the poem. Right. Kicked like a football over the edge of heaven, you landed with a thud on the slimy nighttime stones of a Melbourne alleyway just behind the Paris end of Collins Street and cried, Herald! But soft, Florence, adagio. It's like spying on a small creature hiding in the crevice of a tree and all you see is eyes. Take a soft brush, Florence, a soft brush when you draw out the crystal of his soul. Perhaps, dear boy, oh, now it's gone back, sorry. Perhaps, dear boy, in the stillness of this sitting, you remember you once shone like a round, bright moon, loved by a woman whose whole world she held in her hands when she bent to kiss your soft, soft cheeks. Or perhaps you eye the sunlight that lingers on the cat by name Oliver, curled up in his own red velvet cushion, his soft cat snores a regular rise and fall of belonging. Florence, quick, allegro, the tide is rising and he cannot swim. Swift strokes, Florence, allegro, a square brush, a ballast for the soft round of his cheek held to the light and for the strong white vertical and noose of his rough neck comforter. Allegro, Florence, allegro, he cannot swim. And now one last touch, the last adagio, a soft brush, Florence, lente, lente, his sad eye averted like pensive pools and his lips so tender. Oh, dear boy, I would take your cheeks between my palms and kiss, kiss, kiss away your sadness. You are too young for grief and loss and the cold, jagged streets of nighttime predators. Where do you go when the show is over? You still cannot read the news you spruik? The moon is lost, believed drowned. She was spotted last night directly above Treasury, whining and wailing for want of a bed. Theatre goers, heading home at close of show, saw her make a desperate dash across the sky, leap off the edge of a cloud and land somewhere near the corner of Burke and Elizabeth. Mrs Maloney of Wagga Wagga, staying overnight to visit her Uncle Joe in town, swore she saw the moon sneak past reception at the Federal Hotel, mumbling something about room for a moon in a broom cupboard. In a broiling Melbourne sky, bumped and battered by bellicose clouds, the moon flailed and swallowed water above a gold dust city that rose and fell with the gentle soft and sigh of rest and satiety. Her compass, everything she'd ever believed about the correct placement of heavenly bodies in the universe, had long fallen from her open hand. As the paper boy pressed himself into an alcove of the bakery at the top of Collins Street, away from the wind, he saw the moon fall like a broken swan, stark white against a flat black sky. Silver threads of song surged from her throat. They spun glittering arabesques above a town that rolled over and drew its coverlets over its eyes and over its ears. 
the moon sang of light and shade and of the myriad tears that glistened like fragile pearls along the crust of the earth, precarious in its pivot on millennia of disappointment, always believing that the next spin and the next and the next and the next will bring about a new day. Covering himself with newspaper to keep himself warm, the boy watched ro rolling clouds drive a linear path towards the moon. They encircled her, engulfed her, turned her inside out and muzzled her. Then they swept the moon clean out of the sky, like an errant page of your newspaper, hustled off the road by the wind. Okay. Now, to begin this poem, I looked at how Florence approached the work. The young boy emerges from the dark. The only light falling on him emphasises half his face. His scarf, known at the time as a neck comforter, and his averted eye, all included. Um, let me just move you. I think you can see the image from there. To deal with the issues of social justice, I utilised metaphor and visual imagery. And I moved from panel to panel in that pier glass panel in cinematic mode. I tried many endings but ignored the image that kept coming to my mind, a swan falling from the sky singing her last song. I kept telling myself, you can't add another metaphor now. It's like adding another character. But in the end, I told myself, listen to your instinct. The image would not go away. And it was just right, like Goldilocks's porridge. I, uh, as an artist, I made myself a promise when I began painting. No matter how painful um, a subject is that I want to discuss in my artwork, I made myself the promise that the artwork would be beautiful. Beauty was very important. And so I strive to do this in this work that if I think about the issues and the effects of the issues, the wealth in Melbourne and the terrible situation the boys were in, it gives me great pain. So there you have it, my thesis that Ekphrasis ensures a work of art never dies. Um, it was great to share this opportunity with you. I did want to show you some works of mine that are leaning now more towards Ekphrasis, but I think the time is uh, a factor, so I will leave it there uh, now. Uh, let me try and take you back or get myself back so you can get back. Just a minute, slide the screen as we're told to do. You are presenting and now I shall stop presenting. Click, click, click. I'm gone. Thank you. And we're back. And we're back. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Anita for reminding us at how many layers go into a poem as we're looking at not just um, art and words together, but the, the imposition of the, the musical terms across the top, the, the, the incorporation or the weaving of the historical information and, and certainly the, the visual that goes beyond uh, the portrait that you looked at of the boy and the, and the paper flying away uh, in the wind at the end. Uh, it's just uh, amazing how it's like a, you know, a seven layer cake by the time you get done to look at how it all comes together as one thing, uh, but is put together of a great many things. So thank you, Anita, especially for that. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Oh, thank you. For our uh, final presenter for today, uh, we're going to go to Timothy Green. 
He has worked as editor of Rattle since 2004, which hosts a monthly ekphrastic challenge. He is the author of American Fractal, Red Hen Press, 2009, a contributing column, columnist for the Press Enterprise newspaper, co-founder of the Wrightwood Literary Festival, and communications chair for the Wrightwood Arts Center. He lives near Los Angeles with his wife and their two children. Thank you, Tim, for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sense. My pleasure. Such a great um, you know, discussion panel you have here. Thanks for uh, all the great poems by Hetty and Anita. It's just wonderful to listen to. Glad to be here. Excellent. Um, as a writer and editor, Tim, what do you look for in an ekphrastic work? Well, you know, we've done the ekphrastic challenge for, um, I think, six years now. And I hadn't really thought too much about it as a separate art form. I think what I look for is the same as I look for for all poems. Because um, I think poetry is really one thing, which is what art really is, one thing. And I'm going to switch. Uh, I like to... Um, I'm going to switch to a different camera here really quick. And then uh, I'm going to do a little exercise at first, just to sort of set up how I think about poetry. Um, so here, if this works. Yeah, so I should have a white document on here. Um, I want everybody to um, pull out a, a pen or a piece of paper or something to write with. Um, if you don't have one, if it's not possible, uh, you can just watch, follow along here. But um, it's really fun if you can do this yourself, too. This is my favorite thing to think about in the entire world. And I think this is the heart of poetry and the heart of art and the heart of all that we're doing here. So um, what I want you to do is just draw a line across the piece of paper, okay? Um, and on one end of the line, we're going to put 200,000 years. The other end is zero. So um, the first um, – so this is the present day. Um, over here, we have 200,000 years ago, which is uh, the dawn of human history. This is the beginning of Homo sapiens uh, right here. And um, so, so going back this far, uh, this is how far people were anatomically human. We had brain sizes this, similar today. We had skeletal structures the same as today. Now cut this in half, and you'll have 100,000 years. And in 100,000 years, we, uh, we have this. This is the FOXP2 gene, which is one of the genes responsible for grammar. Um, and so we know that since this gene dates back that far, that we had language and we had speech and we talked and communicated like we do today that long ago. Because without that gene, um, it, we wouldn't have the same syntax. We wouldn't have objects and verbs and things like that. So it's 100,000 years ago. Now split that line in half again, and you get to 50,000 years ago. And 50,000 years ago, was the beginning of um, a, a higher use of technology. So we started to have, you know, for, for millions, of, for two million years, we had pretty much the same hand axe. But about 50 million years ago, we started having um, specialized tools for like spear tips for hunting fish and things like that. And we had, um, these are um, found in a cave in South Africa, I believe they're shells with holes drilled into them to make um, necklaces, primitive necklaces 50,000 years ago. So we had art, we had, we cared about how we looked, we had, thoughts like that, complicated thoughts that far ago. Cut it in half again, and we're at 25,000 years ago. This is uh, the paintings, the famous paintings at Lascaux. Um, so we had cave art, the proliferation of this. And this isn't art, this isn't the kind of art that, um, you know, a kindergarten draws. This is like real art that's, that's alive and full of emotion. And, um, and, and it's all over the world in these cave in these caves uh, 25,000 years ago. We don't know exactly what we were doing there. It might have to do with psychedelics or hypoxia or um, we don't know what, but we were doing things there that are amazing. 25,000 years ago. Cut it in half again and you get to 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago was, uh, let's see here. This is Go Gobekli Tepe. This is probably the, it's what considered at the moment the first church. It's in Turkey. Um, it was intentionally hand buried. 2000 or 12,500 years ago. And um, it's sort of similar to Stonehenge, but full of these, you probably can't see the detail, but full of this amazing artwork. Uh, cut the line in half again, and you get this tiny sliver 6,000 years ago. Uh, 6,000 years ago was the first writing then, on tortoise shells in the Yangtze River, um, cuneiform writing in uh, Mesopotamia. So it's 6,000 years ago, the first writing we had. 
and cut that line in half again, and you're getting this tiny, tiny sliver. I can't even fit it with my marker. 3,000 years ago was the first alphabet. Uh, and so that's the, um, uh, the Phoenician alphabet. So, so only, if you look at this graph again, this is a timeline of human history. And for all of this space, which is almost the entirety of the timeline, um, all we had was poetry. This was the era of poetry. And um, we had no way to record what we wrote. We had art and we had poetry and that's it. There was no way to write down text. There was no way to, um, you know, we had speech. That's what we had. And, um, and so what poetry does is it taps into this history that we have um, mentally. Now, if, if I look back at, um, I have two cats. And my cats, uh, we, we lived in a city uh, for, at first, for the first few years. I never saw a mouse. We moved up to the mountains out in the country. And um, we started getting field mice in our house sometimes. And our cats knew how to catch those mice. Um, even though they'd never seen a cat before. They were already fully grown adults. No cats showed them how to hunt mice. But they knew how to hunt mice. And, um, and that's what we evolved to do. And that's what artists are doing in every aspect of art. So here are some quotes. We do um, interviews with Rattle. And um, we've interviewed 100 poets plus maybe 120 at this point for our issues. Um, and I noticed that they're all doing very similar things. Um, they're all saying the same kind of thing about what they do with art. So this is Billy Collins. I'm trying to get this on the screen a little better. Um, I examine lots of little notions to see if there's a poem in them. Most of the time, I don't find one there. It doesn't flower. It doesn't open itself up to possibility. And then every once in a while, there's a little notion or an observation or a phrase or some little starting point that wants to go on, that wants to go, go to a second step. And then I become like a little bloodhound. A bloodhound. I kind of sniff my way through the trail and try to see what's at the end of it. So it's pretty much catch as catch can. That's Billy Collins. I just have a lot of these quotes here. This is uh, Stephen Dobbins. The poem's beginning was what I think of as inspiration, which is the sudden hitting upon the metaphor, which I may not even know as a metaphor. I may just have an image, and the writing of the poem is trying to discover the object of the image. If something strikes me and I start generating lines in my head, then I have to do something with it. If I have a line, then I have a second line, then I have a third line, I have to go with it. Uh, Yusef Kumanyaka, I usually have an image, sometimes no more than a word that I meditate on, to improvise on. For me, jazz is important. Now, Lee Young Lee, I'm always listening for, trying to feel, just to get a sense of that field of mind that you're in when you write, when a poem happens. So I'm always feeling around for that. And so there's a sense through all these poets, and I, I don't want to go through too long, but um, there's a sense of fumbling around and trying to find your way toward meaning. And like my cat's hunting a cat, we are programmed through this long, deep history that we have to hunt for meaning. And that's what we do. And that's what we do when we make art. And that's what we do when we make poetry. Um, the word, you know, poetry is like a magic spell, but it's also like a mantra. And uh, the word mantra from Sanskrit uh, means mind tool, man, mind, tra, tool. It's a mind tool. It's a tool of transformation and discovery. And so what an artist is doing is... Um, is trying to find meaning through their visual art. And what a, poem is, a poet is doing is trying to find meaning through poetry art. And what we're doing is tapping into this deeper understanding that we have. Um, there's a great book by Ian McGilchrist um, called uh, The Master and His Emissary. He's an Oxford psychologist. He talks about the bicameral brain, the, the two hemispheres that we have. And the right hemisphere is, um, is the holistic sense that makes deep, broad connections, but it has no access to our conscious mind, really. It's the deep undersurface. Um, and the emissary, as he calls it, is the left brain, which has access to the language controls and can manipulate things. And it thinks it's controlling everything. But the right brain is really where all the connections are made. And so what art is doing and what poetry is doing is finding these connections. And, um, and the fascinating thing to me is that these connections come out in dreams. So let me show you. Um, Let's see. Um, so this is a, uh, so everyone's familiar with Edgar Allan Poe. Um, 
And one of the things people might not realize is that Edgar Allan Poe uh, saw the answer to the dark sky night paradox, also known as Olber's paradox. Um, and this is the idea, um, it's postulated by um, Olber's, who realized that at the time, in the 1800s, astronomers thought the universe was infinite. And so that anywhere you looked, there would be a star. Um, and so the fact that the sky isn't full of nothing but stars was a paradox. It was a mystery. We didn't understand. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe here, in Eureka, a prose poem, solved the answer to that mystery a uh, hundred years almost, or 80 years before Hubble found the real answer. So here's how he described Olber's paradox in Eureka, a prose poem. Uh, Were the succession of stars endless, then the background of the sky would present us a uniform luminosity, like that displayed by the galaxy, since there could be no absolutely, there could be absolutely no point in all that background at which would not exist a star. The only mode, therefore, in which under such a state of affairs we could comprehend the voids which our telescopes find in innumerable directions would be by supposing the distance of the invisible background so immense that no ray from it has yet been able to reach us at all. And here is his answer for why that is the way it is. And he used this uh, concept called ratiocination, which is what he used in his detective novels. It was like deduction, but subconscious deduction. One particle, a particle of one kind, of one character, of one nature, of one size, of one form, a particle, therefore, without form and void, a particle, positively a particle at all points, a particle absolutely unique, individual, undivided. Our galaxy is but one and perhaps one of the most inconsiderable of the clusters which go to the constitution of the ultimate. And he goes on talking about um, the Big Bang in the, um, and he use ratiocination to figure this out. Um, another example from art, the way we do this, uh, this is, of course, Van Gogh's Starry Night. And Van Gogh's Starry Night, famously, is um, depicts, we've realized recently, fluid dynamics um, of the cosmic dust of star formation. These are the same patterns that you can see in the Hubble telescope um, that Van Gogh was able to paint hundreds of years before we could see them. Um, and here are just a few other things. This is, uh, so the, uh, let's see, the sewing machine was um, uh, Elias Howe in 1845. Um, he had a dream in which, and I think he was being, what was it? He was being chased by murderers who said they would kill him unless he invented the sewing machine. And when they finally caught him, they started stabbing him. And the uh, knives at the end or the, the ends of their spears had holes in them. And that's where he realized how to make a sewing machine because he was being stabbed in his dream. Um, then the benzene mo molecule came to uh, Frederick Kukulay in a dream. Um, the uh, Einstein had a dream of um, sledding down a hill at nearly the speed of light and looking at the stars and seeing what the stars would seem like. And that's where his discovery of relativity came from. Um, another one that came from a dream is um, James Watson invented or discovered the structure of DNA in 1953. And when he did it, it was a double helix. But this is the caduceus, which is 6,000 years old again. And this is the same double helix of DNA that somehow we intuited 6,000 years ago as sort of the center of medicine. So if um, you know, anybody had an MRA, mRNA vaccine um, this is the basis for stuff like that. And, and somehow we had the structure encoded symbolically 6,000 years ago. So there are these fascinating things that are going on. And, and what we're doing is exploring those connections that we know but we don't know, the sort of magic of the universe. And what artists are doing is finding a way to present that imagistically. And what poets are doing is finding a way to present that um, verbally. And um, so to me... Poetry is always a tool. It's always a mind tool for exploring and discovery. And um, so I'm going to show, I was kind of rushing through that, but I'm going to show you a couple of poems. This is, um, this is Nighthawk. This is the only poem of mine I'm going to show. Uh, but this is, of course, uh, Edward Hopper. And um, Edward Hopper, um, I, I was in the library at USC, in the stacks there, and I found a book of nothing but poems written after Edward Hopper paintings. It was a 300-page book. Every single poem in there 
was uh, written after an Edward Hopper painting. So I thought, why is um, why are there so many poems about Edward Hopper paintings? And so I used poetry as a tool to try to come up with an answer. I don't know if you can see this on the screen or not. This is after Hopper from my book, American Fractal. <clears throat> and this was trying to explore the reason. So it starts out with, um, with this scene, but it builds in other scenes of Hopper's poems. After Hopper, Nighthawks 1952. She says that everything is after Hopper, that posh hotel you looked about to slap her but never did. Sometimes she'd wait at night in her blue robe, face folded like the note you didn't leave crumpled in a coat pocket. Sometimes she'd stand in broad daylight, naked before an open window, flesh so pale and round and full it seemed about to pull a tide of ruddish man up from the street. But mostly it's the red dress, the cut straight, sleeveless, loose, and her mouth is only lipstick. She says you never even see her talk, but just about to talk, about to smile. She says that every moment is a jail. This diner is her prison of endless light, the ceaseless hour always getting late, yet no one moves. Her cigarette remains unlit. The busboy doesn't lift his hands. You could write a thousand lines, she says, and all the things she never does or has. How she seems so sad she might have cried. How you only see her almost satisfied. So in writing this poem, I didn't realize what it was about Hopper paintings that drew us to write poems about them. That was the mystery that I was trying to figure out. And I just started by explaining the painting and what was going on. And in the process of the painting, somehow that tool that evolved in these neural bundles throughout 200,000 years of evolution drew me to that thing that my right brain knew, but my left brain didn't. And that's what poetry does. That's what art does. That's what I look for in poems. Um, I'm going to switch back. Let me see. Let me switch my uh, camera really quick. I'm trying to rush through here. I'm running low on time. But um, and now let me go to my... Let me show you a few poems from really quickly from, from Rattle. So Rattle's Ekphrastic Challenge. Um, we publish two of these poems every month. And we've been doing that for about six years. We have about three, 140 poems, I think. And the interesting thing is that there are two, um, there are two poems paired. So every, for every piece of art, we have an artist's choice, where the art, artist gets to choose their favorite poem. And then I choose one. And so let's look at... And this is a, some short ones. This is a, a piece. Everyone can see that, right? Can someone nod? Okay. So this is a, a Dream Spirit by Christopher Whitney. And um, this is the uh, response by Joel Vega, which was uh, my choice. Uh, Joel Vega, four loaves of stone ascending. Even Noah stepping out of the ark, the world stretching out from his feet in a mighty display of infinite water. Even he picking up the first four loaves of stone, his faith shaken, querying. What shred of cloth can wrap his naked body? What terror or bliss will rise from the receding tides? But the new earth speaks a new language. Come here, it says. Come here, then. Gather beneath the sky, bereft of stars. So see how he goes to um, Noah's Ark in this for a, a deeper metaphor that he found moving in this painting. And notice the bird in the background is only in the background of the poem. Um, it, you know, could, because Noah, of course, the, the story of him sending a dove out. And now look at this other poem. This is another poem from the same based on the same artist. This was the uh, artist's choice. And this is by Christopher Whitney, One for Sorrow. Or no, this is written by uh, Carmel Buckham. One for Sorrow. Once a crow gifted me pine needles tucked into a paper clip. She left it on my windowsill, right beside the bird feeder. I think about love languages, about how long it's been since I felt the smooth warmth of another skin. Fur muscle wrapped around me, heavy and solid and safe. Did you know crows can recognize faces? She definitely knows me. She lets me get close. She's brought me more gifts. A Stella Artos, bottle cap, a glittering earring, a screw head, and a few shiny pebbles. I stack them inside right by the window so she can see that I've kept everyone. I wonder if she's, she'd recognize me with a smile. She's never seen me like that. Crows stay faithful to their partners until one of them dies. I only ever see her on her own. I wonder if she hasn't found her partner yet, or if she is mourning after her lover now lost. 
Crows recognize voices too, so I sing to her when she visits. Sometimes I crack open a pomegranate and she pecks at the arrows right in front of me. I wonder if she sees the stones behind my window. I wonder if she knows she's the reason I'm still here. She always flies away, wings black as midnight, sails into the sky. I wonder what it is about people like me, who love spiders and crows, who let dandelions conquer the garden, who keep one-eyed teddy bear and sand the shattered glass. I'm a defender of all the other broken things, unwanted things, forgotten things, things the world finds monstrous, worthless, things that I find kindred. She deserves her hazelnuts to hop from foot to foot. She deserves to exist. And when she brings me another stone, gray with shimmering specks of silver, and sets it out side of my window, I think maybe I deserve that too. And so that was on The Artist Choice by Carmel Buckingham. And notice how that the the bird in the image takes the foreground it becomes all about the bird and what the bird collects and so there's this deeper these deeper connections that our right brain is making that we're finding ways to articulate and so it becomes this massive conversation that um all of artists and all of human beings are participating in as we experience the world and make meaning out of it and um there are more poems i was going to share but i think i'm over time a little bit. I was trying to squeeze it all in. Uh, so that'll be it. Thanks, though. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah, and not to worry, uh, because we have a, a question and answer time. And so maybe some of uh, what you were going to share will come out in that. And let me urge uh, those who are watching us live, uh, now is the time to send in your questions. Um, I want to thank you, Tim, for, uh, for reminding us that that all art, regardless of, of what form it takes, uh, whether it's that uh, you know, the poetry in word or the art on the cave wall or the music that, um, that uh, Anita had, had woven in, uh, or, or maybe you know, to, to stretch even farther, maybe it's simply having tea uh, you know, one afternoon. Um, all of these things are often not conscious in how we understand them and that many times as a poet we may not be able to say why we have chosen a particular word or a particular phrase or a particular line uh, but there's something that feels right in it and that rightness I think is what you're getting at here there is a kind of rightness that is beneath even our consciousness but is somehow threaded into us from the very beginning. And, and I think that that's an interesting and uh, it's a concept that I want to ponder uh, even longer because that sense of my inability to not totally know myself is a frightening thing. And yet every one of us has to live with it. So, so thank you, uh, uh, particularly for that, that portion and, and for sharing uh, the poems, uh, both from Rattle and from your own work. Uh, as soon as you put up the, the Hopper painting, I said, oh, Edward Hopper. Uh, and so it, it, it's fun sometimes to think about, um, you know, what, what are those touchstones that join people together? You know, you, you, why do I know an Edward Hopper po uh, uh, painting, uh, even if it may not be one that I've seen before? What are his characteristics? The same way that I might, you know, find one of your poems uh, from any of you and say, oh, you know, that's got to be Hetty Hopper because that's the way she writes. I, you know, I, I can see the DNA, even though I can't describe the DNA uh, that's in it. Uh, do any of you have comments, uh, either for one another uh, or for me, before we go to Brittany? I, I, I liked uh, your your presentation very much, and uh, Tim, the the uh, notion of finding meaning because you know when it's right, and when it's right, it's right. Um, and I wrote down a quote that you said that we are programmed to hunt for meaning. Uh, and it is so true. It just rang true with me. Thank you. You're welcome. Teddy, you are muted. 
I think. Yes. I was going to say, I I was going to make the same comment to Tim. I wrote down this, uh, the way we hunt for meaning and the way uh, the, the, this, the need to write poetry, to paint, is a way to delve into the unconscious and how, as Stan just said, we are drawn uh, either uh, to the choice of words or to certain uh, styles of, uh, of painting, either if we're painting them ourselves, or uh, when we are admiring works of art, where really some, some paintings will speak to us, but in a very subliminal way. Yes, I also uh, in, uh, keyed on that, that phrase, that, that programming to hunt for meaning, because I think that, that is what I do. You know, when I, even when I teach, you know, I try to teach students to hunt for the meaning. Uh, and it's not because there's an Easter egg hiding in the poem. It's because there is meaning all around us and we all have different lenses with which to see it. Yeah, exactly. That's the, the fascinating thing about the ekphrastic challenge is, is seeing the two poems side by side. That, um, you know, um, you, and the other thing that's fascinating too is that the artist picks first and so often, and I'll have, I'll like note the one that I, is my favorite. And about 80% of the time, I guess, they pick the same one that I would have. Um, and there's some, there's some sort of fascinating sense to me. There's this human universal at the same time as everybody has a different lens and perspective on the world. And so when you do a pr projects like this, you get to see both playing in at the same time. And, um, and the reason art resonates because it, it hits on that universal thing, that deeper thing that we all share. Uh, but then, but then, the way the individual poems come out um, show the ways that we're all different too at the same time. So that, that's why I really enjoy this uh, series that we do. And Anita's uh, poems really uh, made me made a big impression on me because the, uh, you were focusing on the beauty within the ugliness. And uh, a, a writer mm. or a poet, really, what what do we do? We learn to see. And, yeah. and to, to see as though uh, what seems to be insignificant starts uh, bearing a lot of meaning and we try to unravel these meanings, but at the same time reconstructing ourselves. As Stan said, we learn to know ourselves, you know, through right. writing. And, and your two poems are uh, amazing in that respect because they have so many layers. And uh, I, I was extremely touched by the line when you mentioned the little boy uh, being co covering himself with the newspapers and compassion. But also what I like is the way uh, you identified with the process, the painting process of the artist and how uh, in, she tried to... Um, uh, put the light on certain features. She didn't want to see the ugliness. She wanted to yeah. give the little boy a humanity and a beauty that if people who would yes. leave uh, the theater wouldn't even look at them twice and just consider them just a way of getting, you know, the, the herald. But it's a poignant, multi-layered poem. Yeah, that needs Thank to you. be read many times. Thank you, thank you, Hebra. Uh, sorry, Hedy. <laughs> um, you know, uh, when uh, when I first started painting, a girlfriend came over, took a look at what a work that I had done, and she said, "Oh, let it all hang out." And I thought, "No, that's actually not art." She hasn't seen that. If you let it all hang out, if it was just an angry diatribe against, you know. It, it, a lack of compassion in a community, um, it, it would not have any meaning, really real meaning. It's, it's got to be art, the only way to talk about something important, I think. Art, whether it be it poetry, storytelling, you know, dance, music, visual art, it's the only way, and metaphor, simile, they hold the, the weight of meaning. So thank you. Thank you, Hedy.
Thank you all. Thank you. Let's go over and see if Brittany has anything for us. Um, I've gotten one question so far, and it's aimed at Anita. It's a two-part question. Um, so the first part of the question is, how did you discover you wanted to write poetry? And the second part of it is, why well, you chose poetry and not short stories to reflect on the art pieces that you shared. That's a very good question. All right, they're actually two questions, but they, they, they are one question. So... Look, I think it's a matter of lifestyle, especially for women, and I was very much tied to beauties outside of where my mind wanted to go, and I think it is the greatest punishment. I've regarded it as a punishment because if you are creative, you have to go there. You, you cannot be um, making beds and doing whatever else you need to do to get through life. Um, but it, it all adds up in the end and lockdown became a blessing. I really think I was the only person in Melbourne who just thoroughly enjoyed lockdown. Suddenly I had room to think. I didn't have to halt a thought in the middle of its gestation because something was calling, someone was calling. Um, I could utilise that time. And I, I, over the years I'd often asked myself, I'd looked at my bookshelf and I'd kept all my poetry books way back from school. And I asked myself, I've, I've culled so many books, why am I keeping my poetry books? And occasionally I dip into them. But they're there and I don't think poetry ever left me. I just needed, you know, the right amount of sun, the right amount of water, and it's ready. It's going to go. Uh, and what, what was the second question? I think I, I, I forgot the second part. Short I'm stories. Not... Sorry, oh, the stories. Thank you. Well, in a sense, I think my, my poems are stories. Many of them, I, I mean, the, the paper boy really is, what was his story? Yeah. Yeah, what was his story? Whenever I travelled on the tram with my mother, we would get dressed up to get on the tram, you know, the gloves and the coat and the hat to go to the city. It was a big excursion. And I would stare at the other passengers and my mother would say to me, don't stare, don't stare. But I wanted to know. I wanted to know about these people. Who are they? What's their background? And it's very natural to to tell stories, but I had done it a lot. So the question, why in lockdown, lockdown gave me the, the time I needed. And that, you know, the poems need time to gestate. And sometimes they come in a flash, but generally you need to sit with them, like the ending of The Paperboy. I had to sit with it for a long time till I acknowledged what was in my head wanting to come through. And I wouldn't let it because I knew you don't uh, uh, um, you, you you don't introduce a, a new character or you know an extra metaphor. It's loaded with metaphors. What are you doing at the end of the poem? Doing this? In the end, I said okay, and it was right. And then it finished it off in in the right way. So it's like Michelangelo, I think, with his pieces of marble. He said, the image is there, David's inside. We just have to chisel away and out come. You need time to do that. Anita, uh, can I ask you a question? And I wanted to address it to you because you're so recently turned to writing ekphrastically. Uh, um, how has um, doing that, you know, engaging in this writing form, affected the way you look at art? Has it, you know, is there a difference that the way you see a painting now I mean, if you go to the uh, art gallery? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, can I share my screen with you for a minute? And I'll show you exactly what it's done. Ah, oh, my screen doing silly things. Um, present now. Present now. Here we go. I'm going to show you a work that I created 
in 2018, then 2019, and then 2020. Um, I'm sorry that there is a caption on this. Okay, can you see? I, I, I was going to use it as an introduction, but you can see the image. So I called it Awakening, and it was done after we had floods and we had fire. And it stemmed out of a strong desire to see something new growing up. And you can see it here. But what is happening, it's a new day, a dove rises up out of water, and you can hear the hum of insects, new life. You can see seed popping, new life. But what you see is that the dove's wings are vacant. So you can see the past through her wings. Then we had more fires, terrible fires. We had um, floods, terrible floods. So I used the same painting. I did not take another canvas this time. I took the same painting. Here comes the dove and um, the past again showing through, but the whole work is darker, um, more frantic. Then... We had shocking fires and we had corona. So I decided to keep some of the past but to create something new again and I called this ghost and I made the ghosts far more substantial than the previous two birds because I wanted um, a new reality. So that became a new work of storytelling called One Canvas, Many Lives, where I likened the one canvas to a person. Um, we are one, we have one canvas to paint on in our lives and we um, paint on it and paint over and over and over. So art doesn't die, it just changes. And when I look at a work of art, I see it now as, as a work in pro progress. So, you know, you look at ancient Chinese pottery and you say, this is a modern piece of work. This is incredible. Um, time, time doesn't matter. And you can have a conversation with it. Objects to me are alive. They're like people. They have a story. Everything has a story. You just have to find it in relation to you. I, I hope it's answered your question. Yeah. In response, uh, I have a response to uh, what you just said, which is really uh, 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 struck me when you said we, an artist has one, but one canvas and goes on like in a palimpsest, rewriting or or uh, drawing around it, it reminded me uh, 10 or 15, 15 years ago, Derek Walcott came to Kalamazoo. And um, at the end of the reading, uh, he was saying something that stayed with me that I even used as, as the title uh, for a poem. He said, we all have but one song and must and try to find many ways uh, to sing it. So I kind of modified his statement, but what he said made a lot of sense. And it, it, it really echoes what Stan said. When you read someone's work or when you see someone's painting, you know, it's a, you know, this is a, um, a Degas, everybody knows because of the design, but you recognize Cezanne automatically, you recognize Gauguin, you recognize Hopper. Um, same thing with, uh, you know, with the artists uh, that work with words. When you read Lee Young Lee or Naomi Shibi Habnai, there is no comparison. You, nobody else will write like them. You know, it's, it's their work. So yeah. it's like... I think it's they articulate, we articulate
in many ways either the same song or the same brushstrokes. Mm. 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 A similar insight. Yes, I but think we so. are hunting for meaning, as Tim says. <laughs> yeah, I would say that that our um, you know the, the right hemisphere that is a master is trying to solve the same problem. And, and that, that's how it emerges through different pieces of art. Mm. Excellent, uh, excellent conversation that we're having. I want to check in with Brittany to see if there's anything more. Um, yes, there is. Um, one question I got was open to all three. So Hetty, Tim, and Anita, any of you can feel free to comment. Um, but is there a method or something you do when you get stuck while writing or think the poem isn't going well to try and save it? I can talk uh, for myself because during the pandemic, it's been a, a struggle. I've been working with uh, dozens of uh, uh, manus of uh, poems that didn't seem to go anywhere for a long time. And I, I had a hard time getting my mind in the beginning, the first months off of reading about COVID and dealing with being away from the family and so on. So what I noticed is that sometimes when, if, if I tend to write, let's say, in verse or in prose poems, and it's not going anywhere, I'm stuck at the beginning or at the middle or at the beginning of the poem, then, so, but I really like all those images that I have placed, like the quote that you said, uh, Tim by uh, Billy Collins, when you write drafts or when you're writing um, in your journal, then you reread and you, you highlight some, some lines that seem to be coming out like from uh, the Chauvet uh, or uh, prehistoric uh, paintings uh, or the Lascaux. So um, what I found is that sometimes I would try to work with a form. Like I would say, okay, I'm not going anywhere with my usual way of thinking. Why don't I write a pantoum? Why don't I write a sonnet um, uh, that has a specific rules? Not, you know, not a Shakespearean sonnet, not a modern sonnet, like uh, anima metodi with some mirroring effects. Anyway, something that forces you uh, to control and oftentimes it works because all you have to do is group together what seems to you to be the most important thing and all of a sudden something happens because working with a form forces you um, to look at things differently this is how it you know what what I've discovered recently over the past several months I try to change the form. Um, I have some that sort of along the same lines. Um, I think uh, you know, since we're, what we're trying to do is tap into our subconscious and find meaning there, the things that we don't know we knew. Uh, my favorite book on writing or on art uh, is actually Zen and the Art of Archery, um, which is about archery, but it's the same process. And there's a, there's a passage from here. Uh, this is Harajo. Uh, Zen and the Art of Archery, uh, the right art is purposeless, aimless. The more obstinately you try to learn how to shoot the arrow for the sake of hitting the goal, the less you will succeed in the one and the further the other will recede. What stands in your way is that you have much too willful will. You think that what you do not do yourself does not happen. And so, so what's really blocking you when you're having trouble writing and pushing forward is, is that consciousness that's blocking the subconscious. So what you have to do, like you're talking about finding a form that's different, and you focus on that, and then that frees up the subconscious to come out. And so usually what's blocked is the subconscious mind, and, and that's what all artists kind of struggle with. Uh, we do a Young Poets anthology, too. And um, Sharon Olds, in our interview with her, said that there's no such thing as a bad poet in the third grade. And um, it's so true, because they don't have that self-consciousness blocking their subjective creativity. Um, so the trick is to get rid of that willful will, that attempt at trying to make something happen because because um, it'll happen on its own because it, the subconscious will take care of uh, the meaning that you're trying to find. 
And I could do another quote too. There's another one that I was going to share. This is also from the Zen, The Art of Archery. And it's advice along the same lines. You must hold the drawn bowstring like a little child holding a proffered finger. It grips it so firmly that one marvels at the strength of the tiny fist. And when it lets the finger go, there is not the slightest jerk. Do you know why? Because a child doesn't think, I will now let go of the finger in order to grasp this other thing completely unselfconsciously, without purpose. It turns from one to the other, and we would say that it was playing with the things, or not completely true that the things were playing with the child. And so here, he, you know, he's talking about actually physically letting go of the archery string. Um, but but when, if once a conscious decision, you can't let it go as smoothly as a baby would let go. And so that the trick is to let it go. Or as a, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Man, my brain doesn't work very well. Sometimes. What's the guy's the, the gruffy post office poet guy um, who's really famous? Um, you know, man, why is his name not coming? Anyway, his, his tombstone says don't try. You can look up, look up whose tombstone is don't try, and that's the, the guy. But the trick is to don't try, I think, when you're stuck. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that that piece of advice. I think um, you know I listened to Billy Collins on his uh, on his um, he's got a little video and he said you know you sit with a poem you just he sits with a poem all day and and he won't get up until he's basically got it. Um, uh, but sometimes you need more than a day. But I, I've, I've listened to that uh, advice. I think it's good advice. And um, and I also find just stopping to worry about it is basically what you're saying, Tim. Just letting go, um, go for a walk, engage in something else because you're thinking about it. Even it, it, it's it's gestating and it's growing inside you, and the answer will come when you stop hammering. You just give it a chance to find another way through the door. Yeah, it was Charles Bukowski. I was thinking, I don't know why I couldn't draw his name up, but his tombstone says, don't try. Thank you. Um, and we have come to the end of our time. Uh, I appreciate not only the conversation that we've had from Hetty to Anita to Tim, but the conversation that we continue to have uh, with the art around us, with the poetry around us, and ultimately with the world around us. So thank you for Pierglass Poetry. We'll sign off for today and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.